As I was listening to the word this morning, I was thinking of this verse here in Proverbs. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. And this morning, as I heard the word, I want to examine my heart. What's there in my heart? If I don't watch over it with diligence, I'm going to end up in this, in this condition where I can only praise God when everything is going my way. But if it's not going my way, then I'm going to complain and, and murmur. And even this morning, I think about myself and for each one of us. If we were to take a piece of paper and start writing down all the things that are worrying us, I'm pretty sure it'll fill up pretty quick. Write down that paper. You'll need another paper and another paper. Pretty soon you'll have a big book of things that you can worry about. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure each one of us has concerns about the future. What about this? And you can put that down. And then the next one. Does God know that we have all these things? Yes, he knows it. And he knows what's going to happen in the future. But in the midst of all this, he's looking for some some one or two Actually, he'd li- he would love everyone, but he's looking in the midst of that. Who in the midst of that? They, everyone has that list. Everyone has their book of worries of what's going to happen tomorrow. But in that midst of that, some of those people who have that book of worries, they say, I'm going to thank the Lord and praise the Lord right now. Even though everything within me says to do otherwise and complain, I'm going to choose to do that. And I think about, you know, all the stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament. How would it have turned out if, like, in that that situation where they were going into the land of the Philistine and one person stood up and said, yes, let's go. Everybody else is complaining. And then that would have thrilled God's heart to say, okay, there's one man here who's ready to go. That would have blessed his heart. And I see that with Joshua and Caleb. He found that. And over and over again, Caleb has a different spirit about him. God kind of praised that one man. And over and over again, you you see the book of Joshua. It talks about Joshua and Caleb all throughout. It's all about Joshua and Caleb. Was there 600,000 other people? Yes, but God's talking about those two people who had faith. And I see that throughout the scripture. And I was thinking about even in the boat, um, I was like, Lord, were, were you pleased with anybody Would it have been nice if one of those disciples stood up and said, yes, Lord, you can do it, despite everybody else saying, um, getting worried, I'm going to please you by saying yes, even though the water's coming in. And I was thinking to myself, there was one person in the boat that was, God was pleased with. It was Jesus. The 12 disciples, yes, they lost faith, but Jesus was there. So even in the midst of that storm, God found delight in one person in that boat. And it was throughout Jesus' life. Every place in Jesus' life. Throughout the earth, he would have looked and saw, is there any faith? Is there any faith? And there was one man in whom the father could have full delight in. And that was his son. Because his son would be praising him and thanking him. Whether it was Herod or whether it was Pilate or whether it was anybody. There was one person praising praising the Lord. And then after him, it was Paul in the midst of jail and being tossed in prison and in the shipwreck. In the midst of that, he found one person who was praising the Lord in the midst of it. And you see that even if Pilate, uh, if you return with me to John, Pilate said, Pilate said to Jesus, In John chapter 19, verse 10, So Pilate said to him, You do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you, and I have the authority to crucify you? You might remember this morning we heard, In order to come into this life, we need to be in Christ. We need to be in Christ. We cannot do it on our own. 
Jesus was in the Father. He was completely secure that his Father was calling the shots. So Pilate, when he said this, Jesus said and answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. You have no power upon me. I'm the one in control here. My father is the one in control. You have no control over my circumstances. And the reason for us, each one of us, the only reason with all our book of worries to be able to be confident in any circumstance is for that one reason. It's the one who controls our circumstances. It's not the world. It's not the circumstances. It's not the people. The one who controls the circumstances of the child of God that is you and me, is our Father in heaven who runs this universe. That's the only reason we can also say, okay, I have this book of worries just like everybody else, but I, can't, I don't need to worry because I have a Father in heaven who's watching over me. He cares for me, and I want to be the delight of his heart. When everybody else is complaining, I want him to be able to find pleasure in me. I pray that would be for each one of us, each one of us who's heard this word this morning. Lord, pick me. <laughs> pick me. Let me be the delight of your heart. Let me be one in the midst of everybody around me who's complaining and murmuring. Let me be one in which you could say, I, I, that brother and that sister has a different spirit about them. Believe me, there is people in Luke 12, if you read of that man, Luke 12, the way he wanted to deal with worry this is how he wanted to deal with the worry. Verse 17, Luke 12, 17. And he began, this is that rich man, began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said this, this is what I will do to prevent myself from worrying at all. My, my confidence is not in God. My confidence is that I'm going to build, I'll tear down my barns, build larger ones, and there I'll store my grains and my goods. And verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, guess what? I've provided for many years to come. Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. That was the way he, the people of this world solved for it. Who in the world and who does not want to have this situation where they've saved up everything from years to come, they don't have to go to work, they just want to be at rest. Where was this man's confidence? His man's confidence was in his barns and his grains and everything, and that's why he said, oh, I, I don't need to worry. I have all of these things figured out. And the natural man will want to solve for his life's problems by saving up and taking care of all of this, having their ducks in a row. But... God said the futility. You planned everything out well, but one thing you forgot is that you don't call the shots. You don't know when you're going to live and when you're going to die. But for the man whose trust is in the Lord, as we heard this morning, his, his, his book of worries he can put away and he can say, Lord, in the midst of this situation, no matter what is going on where everybody else is complaining, I want to bring pleasure to your heart. May the Lord help us. Amen. We're going to be hearing from three uh, brothers here today, so they'll come and share with us. I want to read from Proverbs uh, 14, verse 14. It says, uh, the backslider gets bored with himself. The godly man's life is exciting. Um, I have... Uh, Recently, I've been thinking back about my uh, Christian life, how the Lord has led me, and I've realized that uh, my life has been uh, really exciting by God's grace whenever I've been following Him. But uh, when I've been trying to follow my own way, it's been uh, boring because I get bored with myself. And uh, one way in which I see that life is exciting is that uh, God brings us to crossroads and uh, there are different choices, and I'm not sure which one I'm supposed to take. And I see that the Lord uh, wants me to go to Him and uh, I want to sh share briefly uh, an incident which happened in my life uh, where I was trying to sell my old car. And so uh, the crossroads I was at was, should I give it away free to somebody or should I sell it? 
and uh, I had different reasonings, you know, whether I should sell it or I give it away free. I was thinking, is it proper stewardship of what God gave me if I just give it away free? Or do I have the love of money? Is that why I want to sell it? Uh, am I too lazy to do the work which I need to in order to get the car ready, car ready to be sold? And so I also had a, a deadline because I was trying to sell it before I came to uh, Loveland. And through a series of very exciting events, uh, the Lord made sure that the car did get sold, but it, it got sold on a Sunday afternoon, and my flight was on Monday uh, morning. So talk about an exciting life. Um, but um, the lessons I learned was, the first thing is that God cares. God cares about even the smallest details of my life, and that gives me faith that um, I can trust His guidance for the future. Uh, small things like whether I'm faithful with my money, uh, that I'm not lazy, uh, with what he's given, and uh, God made a way, you know, and I see that in Proverbs 16, 9, it says uh, we should make plans counting on God to direct us, and so um, I saw that God wanted me to try different options, so the person I asked, hey, do you want the car free, that person said, no, I don't want it, um, and uh, he brought people into my life who actually taught me how to get it ready, you know, for, uh, to be ready to be sold, and um, this instant gives, really gives me faith that God cares about uh, other areas in my life where I could have questions on which choice I should take. And two verses which have blessed my uh, heart is, one is from um, Psalms 32, verse 8 and 9. It says, um, It says, um, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with a bit and bridle, and or it will not um, with a bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. This morning, the part which I know this verse well, but the part which stood out to me was, "It will not stay near you." And uh, I see the Lord's purpose for me is that as He instructs me, He wants me to be close to Him. And the tendency I can have is like being like a horse which wants to run ahead of Him or being like a mule which has to be dragged because I don't want to follow what God says. But the Lord wants me to be close to Him and I really pray that this will be true in my life. And even when there are times when I can tend to get very excited about something and run ahead, um, another passage which encourages me is... Um, Isaiah chapter 30, verse um, 20, um, yeah, 21 um, and 22. It says, and your ears shall hear a word behind you. And I see that there has to be a word from behind because I've already run ahead. Um, and it says, uh, this is the way, saying this is the way, walk in it. And when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left, and verse 22, then you will defile your carved idols overlaid with silver and your golden plated, gold plated met, metal images. You will scatter them as unclean things. You will say to them, be gone. And that encourages me that God's word is purpose for me is to guide me along the pathway of life, but also to protect me from any idols which I can let take his place in my life. So I thank God for his encouraging word and uh, I, I, I confess my faith that God will guide in the future. Amen. Hi. Uh, what I wanted to share today is uh, Jesus said that those who are forgiven much love much. And that's what God has been showing me since I was first reminded of this a couple weeks ago. Uh, when I see that God forgives me immediately for every bad thing that I do, I'm amazed at his love despite the cost. It makes me want to obey him and pursue holiness all the more. Uh, last week, I saw a boy playing golf with his dad he was close to the hole, but there was a bunker in the way he needed to hit over. I could see immediately that there was no way he was going to miss going into the sand, and I'm sure his dad watching could tell the same. Um, the boy tried, and sure enough, it did go in, um, but after he had fished it out, the dad let his son place his ball next to his own, and he could play the rest of the way from there. To me, this is a picture of how God allows us to face situations where we're likely to fail um, because he knows he can help us up again. 
He knows that even when we have the best inten intentions, we can still fail, and he can help with that too. It's when I see God forgive me in the big things that I understand his love for me the rest of the time. As soon as I repent, his forgiveness is immediate and my conscience stops afflicting me. There's no waiting needed. At that moment, I may not have anything else to claim, no victories to speak of, but somehow the free gift of forgiveness paid by, or paid by his son Jesus is enough. Yesterday, Brother Zach said that Jesus spoke gently to repentant sinners, but harshly to the proud Pharisees who loved money. When I repent, I hear the same gentle words too, but I can't expect him to speak gently to me in, until I get to that point of repentance. And as the freshness of forgiveness fades, um, while the importance of being holy does not, I found something that Andrew Murray said helpful in mundane or in undesirable circumstances. We must all learn to trust in Jesus and rejoice in him, even though our experience may not be what we would like it to be. Recalling to mind these past forgiven sins as we read, as we read in 2 Peter 1.9, helps me see past the dreariness and helplessness I might face now, because I see what it cost him to redeem me. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Um, I saw Baba in the restroom, and he's, he said, who are you? I said, Taylor. He said, oh, you're preaching today. And I thought, I hope, I hope I'm not preaching. So <laughs> I was going to share something that um, Jesus has been doing in my life. Last time I was here over New Year's, the message was about um, God, letting God clean the inside of our cup. And I shared about how I want to be honest. I want to take the lid off the cup and um, ask God to show me what's in there so I can ask um, for him to clean it out. And I had my ideas about how this would happen. Like maybe I'm sleeping, getting ready to go to sleep, and like he whispers in my ear, like, stop doing this. or. I don't like this thing, but that's not how it happened. Um, it's not usually how it happens. It's through our situations and our people that come into our lives. And for me, it's through my failures. Um, I came back to the same pit I was in before. And at that time, the past couple months, uh, I cried out to him and I, I was asking why, why am I here again? And Jesus, he met with me and he he told me, um, Taylor, the reason you're here again is that you keep going to things other than me to fill a need or distract you from the need you have. Um, like um, any loneliness I'd feel, any, any anxiety, any um, guilt, any need for intimacy, I'd go to something else. I'd go to something that we'd call worldly music, movies, um, even talking to some people, relationships. Um, so I, I, I cried out, I felt as if it was, it was habitual what I was doing. I was going to the world to meet these kind of needs, but it never satisfied. So I asked, I said, I need my mind to be re renewed. And he brought to mind the verse in Romans 12, um, Romans 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living, living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is. And that part, do not be conformed to this world, really resonated with me because I was experiencing that. I was experiencing being conformed in the world in the sense of going to things other than God to satisfy these needs. And by His grace, He's allowed me to put away a lot of stuff I used to go to and um, instead of all those things come to him in prayer and when I'm he's taken away uh, is my honest testimony he's taken away loneliness he's taken away um, condemnation he's taken away um, a lot of anxiety and worrying um, the living Bible the living Bible translates or I guess paraphrases Romans 12 to the end of that verse to then you will learn from your own experience how his ways will really satisfy you. And that's really been my testimony the past couple of months. Um, he's, he's allowed me to see that, to really see that it's only by his grace that I'm not failing. I feel like a kid who's kind of just walking and almost about to stumble, but he's keeping me up. And a, a quote I heard from a musician Rich Mullins from the 90s, he, um, 
It really spoke to me and encouraged me during this time too, so I'll read it. To listen to the call of God means to accept some of the emptiness that we have in our own lives and rather than always trying to drown out that feeling of emptiness, instead of always trying to fill it with a lot of junk, allow that to be a door through which we go to meet God. It's a wonderful thing to be able to live in silence and to live in unpleasantness and to still have joy. That doesn't come from the substances or worldly wealth. Joy comes from God. We were created to be centered in and love God. Only when we experience that love are we really free. Anything that would impede that love Anything that would block our own awareness of our need for that binds us up. So moving forward, I thank God for everything. It's all, all glorious to him. Um, but I want to continue to, I want him to continue showing me things in my life that can change, that he wants me to change, but not through like just words, through my actual situations in actual life. And I want to see the things that are impeding, um, things in my life that I go to instead of him. I want to see those things and get rid of them. So. I thank God for everything and thank you for this opportunity.